This is The Green Line, a five-part miniseries focusing on the near-term geopolitical implications of climate change. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. Over my many years of traveling, I picked up a slew of odd knickknacks and unique items. One of which is a Soviet-era Air Force captain's watch, which I absolutely love. But as beautiful as this watch is, there is one downside. Parts. So far, I've had to repair this watch twice, and when it comes to finding some of the internal parts for it, most of the factories that produced parts for this watch went defunct decades ago. These days, there are only a handful of people on the entire planet that still have access to the parts for this watch, all of whom are based in Russia or Ukraine. And out of that incredibly small group of people who actually have the parts, even fewer are willing to ship to Australia. So to keep my favorite watch going, I'm completely beholden to one particular parts guy. And without him, the next time my watch breaks, it's permanently broken. So I am completely reliant on this one particular parts guy. Knowing that all it would take is one stray shell to destroy his shop, or someone to buy his shop out, or him simply to refuse to sell me parts at all, and I no longer have access to the replacement parts, meaning I no longer have my favorite watch. And this concept of reliance is not unique to watches as so much of our current key infrastructure relies on tiny supplies of particular minerals and ores. And without it, our laptops, our phones, and all of our new technologies don't work. Now, as our technology advances, these minerals are becoming increasingly important, particularly when it comes to the next generation of green technology. For example, the next generation of computers, chips, batteries, and nuclear control rods all require minerals like neodymium or terbium or dysprosium. And sometimes the amounts we require are minimal, but our tech doesn't work without it. So I want to dive a little bit deeper into this. And to do so, let's unpack one example in one country. You see, when it comes to the green revolution in tech, there's one thing everybody thinks of first, electric cars. But what a lot of people are missing in the conversation about electric vehicles is the fact that those cutting edge batteries that make those vehicles work require a whole lot of the mineral cobalt a goldy, silvery, almost bubbly looking substance found just below the Earth's surface. What they also don't tell you is that the vast majority of the world's cobalt supplies all come from one place, the Democratic Republic of Congo, also known as the DRC. A country who has less than 20% of its roads paved, and a country whose last interstate conflict ended up with 5.4 million people dead. And it's a country whose cobalt mines, the mines we cannot enter the green tech era without, are often in ungoverned territory. Territories where Kinshasa, the nation's capital, has very little influence, and the rules of might is right hold the power. And if we're going to make more electric vehicles, we're going to need more cobalt, which means we're going to need to get more invested into the DRC. Just to meet the conservative estimates of the projected demand for electric vehicles alone, in the near future, we're going to need to extract 26 times the amount of cobalt that we do today. And we know that the DRC is one of the only places on Earth with enough supplies of cobalt to satisfy that demand. And yet, with everyone knowing how important this is going to be, most of us completely ignore the DRC. We are barreling into a position where our entire green revolution rests on a country that is not only ethnically fracturing, that is not only seeing cross-border skirmishes with its regional neighbors, and a large interstate war seeming more and more likely every day. A nation whose infrastructure is near breaking point and that's even without the increasing intensity of national floods that are set to hit the country. That's the nation we're relying on for our green tech revolution. And yet, we're all doing nothing about it. So the DRC's stability and structure is crucially needed to achieve our green goals. Yet, as we covered in part one and two of this series, even well-established nations with strong national governments like the United States or China are going to struggle with the impacts of climate change. So how is a nation like the Democratic Republic of Congo, with a noticeably weaker central government, going to handle these same crises? And as much as I'm bringing up the DRC in this conversation, this isn't the only country with a situation like this, and we're not even going to be able to get into countries or minerals like our reliance on Angola for neodymium, or Madagascar for terbium. Both weak states, both states we rely on for our minerals, and both states that we aren't doing much to stabilize. Whether it is the DRC, or Angola, or Madagascar, these countries are set to pose a dire weak point in our global green supply chains. So, what are we going to do, what should we be doing, and what impact is this going to have? For now, let's simplify and just focus on one, and let's take a look at cobalt in the DRC, 
and gain an understanding of the country will be completely reliant upon for the next wave of green technology. And to take us through the complicated dynamics of the DRC, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. Traps, Collapse, and Relapse Well, Kinshasa is one of the world's megalopolises. It's a massive city. Nobody really knows how many people live there. But in the next 20 or 30 years, it's supposed to be one of the largest cities on the continent. And so on on the one hand, you arrive at the airport and you'll spend the next few hours uh, pushing through traffic from the outskirts of the city to the downtown, surrounded by, you know, informal settlements or then the closer you get into town, by more formal and developed settlements, but basically a large degree of poverty. 80% of the population or so works in the informal economy. And so it's a, it's a boisterous, loud, messy, noisy, cacophonous, difficult city. And even though it's a massive, massive city, the downtown area would be quite a bit smaller than the downtown area of a small city in the United States. So it's a the elite, and that's a representation of the country as a whole. The elite is very, very small and narrow. They mostly know each other, but masses and masses of the population do not benefit from the enormous wealth of the country. Jason Stearns is a CIC senior fellow and the founder and chair of the advisory board of the Congo Research Group. He's also currently an assistant professor of international studies at the Simon Fraser University and formerly the director of the CRG. Jason has also been working on conflict dynamics in Central Africa since 2001 during which time he's worked for the International Crisis Group, the UN Group of Experts for the DRC, and the Rift Valley Institute. And in addition to that, he's also the author of Dancing in the Glory of Monsters, The Collapse of the Congo and the Great War of Africa. And we're thrilled to have him on the program today. When the Congo was formed in 1885 as a project of the Belgian King Leopold II, there there was none. It was carved up on a map in Berlin by a, a bunch of Europeans. And so in 1885, if you told one person in the east of the country that they were part of the same country as somebody a thousand kilometers to the west, they would have blinked at you and not understood what you're talking about. But over time, it has grown to have a very strong national identity, a very strong sense of patriotism uh, and nationalism, despite the inefficiency and usually the corrupt nature of the political elites. And that's something that I think has been forged, I think in particular through the independence struggle and then through the 32 year year rules of Mobutu Sese Seko, who was a dictator, but did manage to form a very strong national culture. Music is extremely strong in terms of national identity, a shared history, these shared struggles. And so today, you know, Congolese identity is very strong, I would say. It's not a society with one ethnic background, depending on how you count it there something between 280 and 400 different ethnic groups. In the Congo, there's four national languages. It's an extremely rich and plural and diverse society. And yet they share this one very strong Congolese identity. The DRC is a massive country. And to lay out just how big it is, if you were to put it over a map of Europe, the four corners of the country would be in the North Sea between Norway and Britain. The top right corner would be on the Russo-Latvian border. The bottom right corner would be in the south of Greece, and the bottom left corner would be in the west of France. But unlike those Western European countries, only around 20% of DRC's roads are actually paved, and travel between parts of the country is often difficult to say the least. Someone who lives in a city like Batembo in the northeast would have to drive for seven days along dirt roads, hoping none of them were out of order at the time, in order to reach the capital Kinshasa in the west. With these obstacles sitting in the way, how often do people from the east and west of the Congo actually intermingle with each other? Most of the population probably is confined to the areas they live in, and that's largely dictated, I would say, by the socioeconomic circumstances. First of all, there are no roads connecting the east to the west of the country or the north to the south of the country. The, the infrastructure of the country is extremely dilapidated. So to do any of that, you have to travel by air. The average income of a Congolese is several dollars a day, and so they would never have funds to be able to do something like that. And yet, they all grow up with a sense of identity, and they refer to, to common things. You know, Congolese culture used to be the one of the biggest export music markets in, the, in on Africa. You know, my in-laws, for example, are Tanzanian. They grew up listening to Congolese music. Nigerians grew up listening to Congolese music, and very much in the same way as Nigerian movies today dominate the continent. 
Congolese music did that for the better part of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And so I think that many Congolese, even though they've never been to Kinshasa, they have a similar vocabulary, they share common ideas, notions, and that unites them. And although they do have this cultural hegemony, there is serious logistical encumbrances that will have economic fissures through the country though. Kinshasa, in the southwest of the country, is able to receive goods through its major ports. With goods coming in from the South Atlantic, into their tiny 40 kilometer long coastline, down the Congo River, with the goods then being taken off the ships in major cities like Kinshasa. People in the east of the country, though, would have to wait a very long time and go through some great hardships to receive any of those goods coming into the ports of Kinshasa. So for the millions of Congolese who are living in the east of the country, are they relying on Kinshasa to send these goods down the long dirt roads, or are they turning eastward and receiving their goods down the highways from Kenya into Uganda and then into the DRC, or even buying goods from Rwanda or Burundi? For those millions of Congolese living in the East, is their lifeline in Kenya or is it in Kinshasa? Almost everything in the East comes out of ports of Mombasa and Dar es Salaam. It comes from East Africa, not from Kinshasa. Very little comes to the Kivus from Kinshasa other than money from the central, central bank. Um, otherwise, almost all of the food, foodstuffs and food goods, uh, electronics, et cetera, et cetera, they come from East Africa, and then from there they come on from, they, they come from Dubai, they come from Guangzhou, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the trade networks are very, very different in terms of where you're, whether you're leaving, living in the East or the West of the country. The foodstuffs people consume are actually not from the Congo. So a lot of the rice and sugar comes from South and Southeast Asia. A lot of the, the meat and chicken comes from, from South Africa and, and Europe. The Kivus are a bit different in the sense that even though the Kivus are the area of the country where most of the conflict is now concentrated, it's also the area of the country with the least amount of malnutrition. And that's because it is such fertile land. The east of the Congo looks kind of like Switzerland in terms of, or parts of it do, rolling green hills, pasture lands. And so the markets there will be filled with local foodstuffs. They'll be exporting to other parts of the, con the country. Uh, whereas that is not necessarily the case in Kinshasa that's much more dependent on imports from around the world than the Kibbutz is. While staying on these eastern provinces, where the food is either produced locally or coming from the entire other side of the African continent, and where the police as well are very localized, how much influence does the central government in Kinshasa have over these areas? Licenses, rules and dictates coming out of Kinshasa, how respected are they in the eastern parts of the country? In theory, the Congolese government is a decentralized government. 40% of revenues are supposed to be retained at the local level, 60% in Kinshasa. And yet, when it comes down to the reality, the de facto power is concentrated in Kinshasa. Power, up until now, there have not, never been local elections. And so mayors are appointed from, and territorial administrators are appointed from the center of the country. The heads of the various different tax agencies, the heads of the various different parastatal companies, they're all appointed from Kinshasa. And so the government is very, very focused on Kinshasa. That's where the bulk of the money is. That's where the power lies in terms of administrative appointments. And so even though each, each uh, province of the 26 provinces, they all have governors who are elected locally, they have parliaments that are elected locally, a lot of the power still resides in Kinshasa. And what are the main exports coming out of these regions? The, the export market of the Congolese economy is completely dominated. I think it's something like 95% of Congolese exports are mining exports. And of the mining exports, almost all of those are from the southern provinces, what used to be Katanga, now Lualaba, Okatanga provinces, some Tanganyika. So the southern mining belt, um, which is copper and cobalt, that dominates exports to a very dramatic degree dominates state revenues, dominates exports. And so that's coming from the south of the country. The, the rest of the country, the economies are, are much more diverse, I would say. They are dominated by agriculture still. Uh, even in the east where there is a lot of mining, the mining in the east is of a different nature than in the south. The southern mining is mostly industrial mining, and especially the stuff that generates profits and revenues is mostly industrial mining. Big multinational mining companies, Glencore, largest mining company in the world, some of the big Chinese mining companies, those are the ones you find in the south of the country. In the east, it's mostly artisanal mining. There are a few industrial mining companies, but they're very few. In the east, we're talking about tin, tantalum, gold, 
those are the big minerals coming out of the east, and most of those are artisanally mined, with a few exceptions here and there. I'm just inserting a bit of context here. Artisanal mining, or small-scale mining, is usually done by subsistence miners, guys usually using hammers and picks and shovels, and for the most part are not usually employed by the mining company themselves, but work independently mining minerals using their own resources to do it. These are the kind of miners you would usually think about when you envision the African man with a shovel trying to dig enough gold to feed his family for the week. Industrial mining, on the other hand, is much larger scale, with massive machines and industrial diggers. Industrial mining is the major type of mining you would expect to see in countries like Australia and Canada. So with that all in context, let's get back to Jason. And so the, that creates a different kind of political economy. There's many, many more people involved in the mining because it's artisanal. Industrial mining doesn't require a lot of people. So profits are much more concentrated in a very narrow class of more professional workers. Whereas in the East, it's, it's unskilled labor, if you want to call it that, uneducated labor, migrant labor, often pick and shovel guys in mines. Uh, and so that's, a, that's the, the kind of mining economy that dominates the East. But the East, because it's so fertile um, in terms of the agricultural sector, it has coffee, it has cocoa, and then it has a lot of subsistence farming as well that just serves for the consumption of the people farming and for the, the very local economy. That's the, the East. Um, Kinshasa is the, the capital of the country, and so its economy is just dominated by trade, you know, by governments, because the government's concentrated there. A lot of people in Kinshasa are employed by government or get revenue from government in some shape or form. And then the rest of the country, to be, I think, extremely reductive, is subsistence farming uh, and fishing, uh, with a few pockets that are oriented ex uh, ex externally. So, for example, there's diamond mining, but in, it's very poorly done and very inefficiently managed at the moment in the central Kasai region. And there's a few other pockets of either plantation or mining economies that are oriented towards a, an export market. Otherwise, everything is, is very, very local in the rest of the country. We probably don't have time for the full story on this particular piece, so we might look at releasing a shorter piece that goes into the story of the Congo Wars. But to summarize the key points that brought us to where we are now, today, Congo has been greatly shaped by the First and Second Congo Wars, with the Second Congo War in particular, that one spanning from 1998 to 2003, with over 5.4 million people dying in that conflict, a death toll higher than all of the belligerents in the Afghanistan, Vietnam, and Korean Wars combined. To vastly oversimplify and run through the points though, in summary, Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi, who'd effectively won the First Congo War, had stationed troops right across the Democratic Republic of Congo, or DRC. So when Kinshasa asked them to leave aggressively, Uganda and Rwanda invaded the DRC again from the northeast. And much like the First World War, this escalation of tensions triggered a tangled set of alliances across the African continent, and what would ensue is a war raging with the DRC, Angola, Chad, Namibia, Zimbabwe, Sudan, and radical anti-Rwandan forces, mostly genocide survivors, as well as anti-Ugandan and anti-Burundian forces on one side, and Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, and many other smaller groups on the other. But in relation to this conversation, for such a huge war with so many casualties, why didn't we see any intervention from the United States or other Western forces? Why wasn't there any attempt to try and put an end to the bloodshed? There's numerous factors there. It was an extremely important conflict. It was in the heart of Africa. This was constantly on the, on the agenda of the UN Security Council and often in the media, although not nearly enough, I would say. And yet, as you point out, you didn't see, you saw foreign involvement, but it wasn't the kind of involvement that could have swung things. And in fact, to a certain degree, some of the most important Western powers in particular were, you could say, complicit with some of the dynamics going on in ways that I can highlight in a second. So I think the, the first reason you saw little or not enough involvement, perhaps, was the Rwandan genocide. There was, you know, initially at the end of the Cold War, there was this note, this feeling in the United States in particular, that we were entering into an area of unipolarity. The U.S. had much more leverage and leeway in terms of what can do internationally. And this then gave rise to greater interventionism in the Balkans, in Somalia. And that then led to a backlash, especially domestically in the United States, where many people felt that, especially after Black Hawk Down in Somalia, the U.S. should not be the world's policeman and did not fare well when it tried to be the world's policeman. That then led to new congressional restrictions on the use of military force by the United States, especially participation in U.N. peacekeeping missions. 
and led to a much greater reluctance to act in the case of the Rwandan genocide in 1994. That's so the Somalia, the lesson, you know, you always learn the lessons from the past war. In the case of Rwanda, the lessons were from Somalia. And that's one of the reasons that Bill Clinton and his administration were very reluctant to engage in Rwanda because they saw what had happened in the case of Somalia. And they learned, you could argue, the wrong lessons from that. And then Rwanda, similarly in case of the Eastern Congo, were reluctant to act. There was a there was a UN mission to the Eastern Congo that uh, that looked at these refugee camps in 1995 and said, "Look, if we did not, we do nothing. This there will be conflict." Paul Kagame, then the the vice president, but the, obviously the strong man and the real power behind the throne in Rwanda, made a visit to Washington in 1996, saying, "If these refugee camps aren't aren't disbanded and dismantled, then then we will have to take matters into our own hands." So it was clear that something was going to happen. And yet nothing did. Um, these camps were in violation of international law. They were right on the border with Rwanda from, you know, armed groups were launching attacks into Rwanda on a daily basis almost. It was, it was obvious this was uh, a huge cause for instability. And this UN mission of military um, advisors came to the conclusion that they would have to be dismantled through a heavy handed military intervention that would break up the military grip that these rebels had on these camps and would displace the camps into the interior as international law requires away from the borders. And that would cost something on the order of several hundred million dollars and several tens of thousands of peacekeepers. Now that price tag at the time seemed to be a, a pretty steep price tag to pay. But if you look now in retrospect, in terms of how much the wars have cost, how much blood and treasure has been spent on these wars, that was nothing to pay at the time. And yet there was no appetite for this. I think that sort of provides part of the context of this. The other part is just that the Congo seemed so huge and intractable. It was a, a huge lumbering mess of a country, and it was just very unclear for outsiders what any kind of action could do, how to not just deal with the military imperative, but to rebuild this country out of the huge mess that it had become. So I think all of these things combined to create this reluctance and, and just aggravate what in general is an apathy in many Western countries with regards to African conflicts. And now, just over 20 years on from the conflict, we're beginning to see these same tensions boiling over again between the DRC and Rwanda, with the rhetoric seemingly worsening week by week, both sides sending in military forces and firefights already breaking out. Are we witnessing a whole new round of tensions between Rwanda and the DRC? So in 2006, the country was reunited, created a new national army, created a host of new democratic institutions. So you have 26 provinces, you have provincial governments, you have a national government, you have parliaments both at the, both at the provincial and the national level. You have democratic institutions, including a new election commission. And so you have these hosts of new institutions. And on the paper, things were going relatively well. You had 130,000 people demobilized, including 30,000 children during this whole during this peace process. And so the problem then emerged that the, the peace deal that had brought these belligerents together disfavored one belligerent in particular. And this was the Rwandan-backed RCD movement that occupied the third of the east of the country, um, but was extremely unpopular. And this is the magic of a peace process. You have to bring these parties together and, and make it seem like it's in their interest to stick to this agreement. And where it was initially perhaps in the RCD's interest to engage in this deal because they got then a share of power and there was a lot of power and money in Kinshasa to go around, after those three years of the transitional government, they were eviscerated politically. And so they went from controlling a third of the country, including much of the wealthiest part of the country, to 3% roughly representation in national institutions. And so this eviscerated the RCD and led a part of the RCD rebellion, backed by the Rwandan government again, to launch a new, much smaller rebellion in the Eastern Congo called the CNDP. This was led by the rebel leader, very charismatic rebel leader, Laurent Kunda, and was again backed by the Rwandan government. This was not like 1998 was, uh, a massive invasion of Rwandan troops. Rwanda did not invade. It was no longer conceived, uh, seen as legitimate to, to invade the Eastern Congo. This was a, a, a much more surreptitious and secret clandestine mission to back this new CNDP movement. And the CNDP movement was also much more, much narrower. So whereas the RCD had been multi-ethnic, controlled around a third of the country, uh, brought in elites from many parts of the country, 
was seen as a national movement in terms of the kinds of people who participated. The CNDP by Laurent Kunda was very narrowly ethnic. So it was uh, represented uh, initially only Congolese Hutu and Tutsi, these members of the quote unquote immigrant communities from during the colonial period. And, uh, and, then eventually, and, and then eventually many of those Hutus were whittled away and co-opted by Kinshasa. And so it ended up being a very narrowly Tutsi movement. Now Tutsi represent, the Tutsi represent less than 1% of Congo's population probably. And so this is a very narrow movement. And yet they were able to take or get to the, at least to the gates of the regional capital of Goma in 2008. And it was only then intervention at the highest level, diplomatic level, that led to the arrest of Nkunda, the integration of the CNDP into the National Army, and the brief dismantlement of the CNDP. Now, the reason this was so critical is this was like the fledgling period of this new Congolese army. And as a reaction, Kinshasa, instead of trying reacting to this threat by creating a new strong national army and merit meritocratic security forces, it reacted, but with the opposite tendency, it reacted through fragmentation. And so, whereas the CNDP was just one armed group, what happened was an explosion of armed rebellion in the Eastern Congo, where uh, you had local communities mobilizing against the CNDP on their own uh, accord. You had commanders defecting from the new national army because they couldn't find their, they couldn't see their interests met within the new national army. And you had Kinshasa actually backing a host of new armed groups in the Eastern Congo as a way to prop up, uh, prop up the national army and to get back at Nkunda. And so this led to a proliferation of armed groups during this period. And so, you know, whereas the Great Congo Wars, the first and the second wars up until 2003, you saw maybe a dozen main armed groups. Uh, and during this period, we really see the beginning of an explosion of armed groups. And to, to, to the extent that today we can count about 120 different armed groups uh, in the Eastern Congo. And so that's led to this metastasis of rebellion, of conflict, but it's also led to a situation where many members of the security forces themselves are actually actively benefiting from conflict. And so conflict in the Eastern Congo today is this sort of perverse equilibrium where you have armed groups fighting against each other on the battlefield, yes, but all of them also with uh, a vested interest in maintaining and preserving conflict. And that goes for both the National Army as well as for many of these insurgent groups, as well as for the neighboring Rwanda. And so many of these main stakeholders have no interest in getting rid of this conflict. So, you know, I think that describes the broad dynamics behind the conflict today. Uh, as I said before, the CNDP was dismantled in 2008, but then re-emerged as a new rebel group called the M23 in 2012. That again was defeated in 2013 and then re-emerged last year in November of 2021 as the M23 again. And today we're in a situation that is really deja vu in the sense that the M23 is approaching the gates of Goma as we speak. And many of those other armed groups that I spoke about, they were armed by Kinshasa or in complicity with Kinshasa or just local communities or local opportunistic commanders trying to seek their own profit or their own protection, also mobilizing. And so we're in a phase of escalation once again today. So if we're hoping to mitigate climate change and we're hoping to build these electric cars and other green technology, let's take a look at the state of the country that we'll need to get our cobalt from. The cobalt, which is the make or break for the next generation of green technology. That country that we're relying on has less than a fifth of the roads being paved and has internal logistics so poor that half of the country is forced to turn to the opposite coast of the African continent for supplies. It's a country where the government in Kinshasa has done everything it can to centralize power thousands of kilometers away from where these mines are. So the grip here in these mining provinces is viewed as somewhat tenuous at best. And now on top of that, we're seeing Rwanda and the DRC retreading the exact same path as 20 years ago. A path that ended in almost the entire African continent going to war and 5.4 million Africans dead. This is the country that will be the make or break for if these green technologies are affordable enough to take off and become widespread. An absolute prerequisite for them actually to have their intended effect. And yet, Western powers seem to be somewhat burying their heads in the sand over this one, and leaving the entire stability and security to the private mining companies to figure out. So how has that worked out? What is the security like with these private companies calling the shots, rather than outside forces, or even Kinshasa for that matter, calling the shots? Well, to answer that, we turn to our second guest. 
Part 2. The Hard Cell for a Vital Hell. Well, if you think of copper and cobalt, which are two of the major mineral exports from Congo. One, the reason people would go for cobalt primarily is because the Congo holds around two thirds of global reserves of cobalt are held in the Congo. Uh, around two thirds of global supply as well currently comes from the Congo. So there's a global dependence upon the Congo for cobalt supply. So in that sense, it becomes essential. And then for copper, while that global dependence is far less, Nonetheless, Congo is known for having extremely high grade copper deposits and reserves. So extremely highly valued assets strategically and financially for many of the miners. And of course, the other side to that is while there might be high risk in getting set up and established in the Congo as a foreign mining company, once you have managed to achieve that, and if you can get in, then the rewards are equally high in the sense that it's still a relatively lightly regulated regime within which mining corporations can operate once they are set up and established with quite some freedom in terms of how they are controlling value flows between their various subsidiaries and, and overseas companies and redirecting profit and value to shareholders and directors overseas and so on. So yeah, I think it's a high risk, high reward environment. Ben Radley is a political economist and lecturer in international development at the University of Bath, specialising in economic transformations within Central Africa, with a particular specialisation on labour dynamics and the role played by northern companies in the region, with Ben's work centred around the mining sectors of Burundi, Rwanda and the DRC. In addition to this, he's also the author of the upcoming book, Disrupted Development in the Congo, The Fragile Foundations of the African Mining Consensus. And we're thrilled to have on the program today. So cobalt is extremely important. It's one of the critical minerals for the hoped for global transition to low carbon technologies, low carbon economies and societies. Electric vehicle batteries, lithium ion batteries, uh, nickel variants, it's cobalt is used in the cathodes in many of the cathodes that form those electric vehicle batteries and uh, something myself and some others wrote a paper a few years ago I think there was around a 87,000% increase in demand by 2060 expected for electric vehicle batteries. And currently cobalt is an essential component of most of those different forms of batteries that are being put together. It's also used as in magnets, in wind turbines and, and some other low carbon technologies, but predominantly it's the electric vehicle batteries. Well, to start with, who's doing the actual mining of these minerals? Is it big companies or local groups? or even individuals with shovels, who is actually getting the cobalt out of the ground, onto vehicles, and then out to Chinese refineries to be made into batteries? What occupies most people's minds is this idea of child labor in cobalt. And I think that comes predominantly from media coverage of the issue. There was an Amnesty International report a few years ago around child labor in cobalt supply chains. And I think this is what tends to grab the headlines. But I think that only represents a very small part of what is going on. I think the way to break it down is if we think about large scale industrial mining on the one side and then artisanal and small scale mining on the other side. It's thought to be around one third of cobalt in the Congo is being produced by around 150 to 200,000 Congolese miners working in artisanal and small scale mining. And the remaining two thirds is being produced industrially by predominantly Chinese mining firms. And then within the industrial space, you have that mostly occupied by Chinese miners. And in the artisanal and small scale space, I would say, as has been well documented in media and other reports, there is this aspect of child labor, which is a component of that, uh, as well as very tough, uh, in some cases, horrific working conditions. At the same time, I think there's a need to see the artisanal and small scale mining sector in Congo in a slightly more nuanced light compared to how it's often perceived and portrayed in the media in the West, in the sense that while it does have components related to child labor and other labor rights and human rights issues across the country, one thing that a lot of research over the last several years has, has revealed and indicated is the social and economic importance of artisanal and small scale mining as uh, a relatively well remunerated livelihoods compared to other opportunities available in many rural areas in the Congo. 
which many of the Congo's poorest or poorer rural households and families are dependent upon for a source of income. And so there's a tension now, I think, to the extent to which that there is this sense created around the need to clean up global supply chains in cobalt and address these perceived supply chain issues around child and labor rights in artisanal and small scale mining in Congo. But I think one of the potentially unintended consequences of that is it pushes buyers more towards sourcing from industrial mines. And then it sort of undermines uh, and potentially pulls away from the artisanal and small scale sector. Uh, and so I think there's a need to nuance that picture and realize that artisanal and small scale mining in Congo is not only child and labor rights violations that that exists. And that's a part of it in the same way that that exists. And that's a part of any economic productive activity in the Congo. So there seems to be a lot of talk at the moment from tech companies, particularly about trying to mitigate some of the harms and these mines cause to the local populations, but without pushing these miners out of the jobs they need to be able to feed their families with these companies stating that they hope to create ethical supply chains for the cobalt they need. And to many, this seems like a great idea, and people can jump into their new Teslas, won't have to think about the suffering of the Congolese children required to make these batteries. To us here on the show, though, it rings a pretty familiar alarm bell, and with a lot of the industry's proposed measures sounding a lot like the global diamond trade. But to explain why these alarm bells are going off in our head at the moment, I think we should do a bit of a comparison between the diamond and cobalt trades. You see, at one point, diamonds had much of the same reputation that cobalt has right now, with people seeing images of diamonds being mined by children in absolutely awful conditions. And on top of that, it was very well known that diamonds being mined in conflict zones were being used by dictators to skirt sanctions and pay for everything from 100-year-old bottles of cognac to gunship helicopters that would be used to terrify their populaces. So in the early 2010s, with international organizations looking to step in and regulate the industry, the diamond industry stepped forward and announced the Kimberley Accords. The Kimberley Accords being an international and universal ledger of every single diamond, listing where it was pulled from the ground, who dug it up, and who that diamond was sold to. So every diamond seller internationally could look up where that diamond was from and be reassured that their diamond was dug out of the ground in South Africa by a multinational company using fairly paid miners. And these accords sounded great. Everyone patted themselves on the back and congratulated the industry on being able to regulate itself. In reality, though, the Kimberley Accords did very little to stop the trade of conflict diamonds. And to demonstrate how easily these sanctions were skirted, let's look at the Central African Republic. During this period of time, the Central African Republic was one of the largest diamond suppliers globally. But when the country fell into internal conflict, when the government began an incredibly nasty campaign against its citizens, the world began to pay attention as footage of machine guns, which were painful by blood diamonds, were making the news worldwide. So as a response to this in 2013, the Kimberley Accords kicked in, and the industry announced that they would be labeling all diamonds from the Central African Republic as blood diamonds, and would no longer be accepting them in trades. The industry clapped, the news cheered, and we all went home. But within just a few days of this announcement, South Sudan, just to the east of the Central African Republic, began selling whole loads of diamonds. In fact, quickly becoming one of the top 10 producers of diamonds overnight, even though the South Sudan doesn't have a diamond mine. And it was obvious to almost everyone that these diamonds were simply being dug out of the ground in the Central African Republic, walked over the border into South Sudan. The seller would then claim they discovered it in South Sudan, and these diamonds would enter the market like any other diamond, as they would begin the Kimberley Accords accreditation process right there in South Sudan, rather than the Central African Republic. The entire Kimberley Accords were outmaneuvered by people simply putting the diamonds in their pockets, walking over the border into South Sudan, and claiming they discovered them there. Now, when we fast forward to today, and we see that the cobalt industry is facing similar calls for regulation, do you think that cobalt will actually end up being regulated to get rid of some of these bad actors? Or is it more likely to just end up the same way that the Kimberley Accords did for diamonds? Will regulation actually eliminate these problems when it comes to cobalt? For the last 10 years or so, there's been a concerted effort by the international community to address this issue of perceived issue of conflict minerals. This is the line of thinking that these minerals were being, to an extent, controlled by various non-state armed groups and profits were being made from the trade and export of these minerals that were then going back into conflict financing. And the idea has been, okay, we need to reduce this conflict financing through not so much sanctions, but by putting in place what they talk about as due diligence and traceability mechanisms, whereby, for example, 
Apple or Intel can trace the origin of the minerals they're sourcing from the Congo and they can say these have not contributed to conflict financing in the Congo. So those mechanisms are in place, um, particularly around tin. There's been the International Tin Research Initiative, which is a tin industry association globally that has been rolling this out and it's coming in more recently for gold. And I think what we have learned from that experience is, is that it, precisely this is an extremely difficult thing to address through these kinds of responses, precisely because they are quite easy to circumvent on the ground. So what I would say coming out of the 10 years of experience of trying to do this in the Eastern Congo around the three T's and gold, I think it is still fair to say today that it is very difficult to say with confidence. While Apple and Intel might hold up and say these minerals are conflict free. I don't think that those initiatives on the ground in the Eastern Congo, I don't think people have as much faith or certainty or belief in them that they are functioning and doing the job that they are trying to do. I think the danger is it becomes this exercise in greenwashing whereby companies use these initiatives to say everything is fine and we're producing ethically and so on and so forth. But the reality on the ground is that very little has changed as a result of these initiatives other than giving consumers greater confidence in the products that they're buying. So if regulation is looking untenable and the DRC will remain our source of cobalt, will we start to see more countries, both in Africa and abroad, start to get more deeply involved in the politics as well as the stability of the Congo going forward? Yes, absolutely. I think given the importance particularly of cobalt, but also copper, which I talked about cobalt as being a critical mineral and metal for the energy transition. Copper is also one of those. Copper is used to quite high proportions in a whole range of low carbon technologies. And so given Congo's uh, importance in terms of its reserves of copper and cobalt and the need for these in the context of the global energy transition, yes, I think it's, uh, it's only common sense dictates that over the, in the coming years and decades, Congo will become more important to outside actors and countries. I think what you see within this green transition and this hope for transition to low carbon economies and societies, particularly if you look at, for example, the green new deals that are coming out of the US and coming out of Europe, within these green new deals, the idea for the US economy and for European economies is that this green transition will be used as a boost to generate green jobs and productive employment, new emerging industries. And the role of Congo and many African countries more broadly within this transition is basically to provide the raw materials that are going to be required to produce and export these technologies, of which Congo and other countries are hopes to then be, be importing those exports. And you can see within these Green New Deals that are being talked about, there's a lot of focus, as we've been discussing, on how to address supply chain issues within these raw materials, such as cobalt and copper. So with a bit of PR and some added paperwork, mining companies will now be facing minimal scrutiny for their practices in countries like the DRC. But with the knowledge of just how awful some of these mine sites are, could we even shut them down if we actually wanted to? as there's an argument to be made that all it would do is create a whole bunch of unemployed Congolese, whilst at the same time eliminating the world's main cobalt supply. And with it, the global supply of electric batteries needed for electric vehicles. So what should we be doing? Is there a way to fix this issue without derailing our entire decarbonisation process? And what role will Kinshasa be playing in all of this? Well, to answer that, we turn to a third guest. Part 3. The Silver Lining from Harmful Mining It's like a double-edged sword. At the same time, there have been some good impact. You have all this cash coming in communities and you have cities or towns that never existed. But since people have some cash coming in, they can build houses and send their kids to school. There have been a lot of things that have moved in the right direction. Unfortunately, at the same time, this boom has fueled a lot of conflicts. There have been research showing the maps of conflicts and the one of mineral extraction, and you can see a lot of overlaps. Bosisi Nkuba is a professor of natural resources, mining and environment at the Center of Expertise on Mining Governance and the University of Bukavu. Bosisi has written several papers on the developments of the mining sector within the DRC and the Great Lakes region. And we're thrilled to have him on the program today. 
This started around 1998 when Rwanda attacked Congo for the second time. And you could see a very huge interest in minerals in uh, Isangani that you even had Rwandan and Ugandan who were allies starting to fight against each other about diamond and gold in Kisangani. Many lives so, uh, lost and many other bad things that this community have endured as a consequence of the mineral boom. Many civilians living in these towns expected that the mining companies would build up the communities around the mine sites as well, upgrading the roads, upgrading the rail, and help solve some of the long-standing problems within the community, such as the roads constantly washing away in the wet season. So what sort of infrastructure have the mining companies built in these areas? It's actually quite tricky for these mining companies when they have to work in a weak state. So if they were in a country with a very well-organized government, of course, there would be pressure on them to develop long-lasting infrastructures. When it's easy to bribe whoever is in charge to make sure the roads are sustainable, at best, you just build a road that will help you take your products out of the country and then you know clearly that after a few years of stopping your operations, this work will be washed away and you don't care. So you can spend some money on maintenance, but not spend too much to build something that can last for several decades. And this is one big weakness, not from the companies themselves, but from the government that is not able to, to pressure, to have infrastructures that can help more the community. And it's so easy when there is corruption for any of the authority to be looking more toward their own interests because, yeah, if I don't do so, maybe my boss will take this money or things still won't work. So it's, it takes really a lot of change in the government or in the way the country operates to really be able to take advantage of this uh, extracting activity that is going on and convert it into road and other infrastructures. So one example is the Katanga in the south of the country where you can see the longest paved roads of Congo and it connects Kolwezi, which is a cobalt and copper mining area to the border between Congo and Zambia in Kasumbalesa. And it's like four plus hundred kilometers of very good roads where cars can go at a hundred plus kilometers per hour. Having these roads is more of a local effort where some authorities over there were like, yeah, we have to build something really sustainable. And this has been done. Unfortunately, when you look at the rest of the country, you don't see such infrastructures that have been built anywhere. So people are still struggling to go from town to town or village to village to get their agricultural product out since none of the authority has taken advantage of the mineral production to prepare the basic infrastructure in terms of transportation and the same extent to schools, uh, hospitals, and other things where the money produced by minerals could have really helped provide to the community a better life standard. But yeah, it has not been done, unfortunately. It's not a complete free-for-all, though. And international companies still do have to apply for mining licenses through Kinshasa. But even these new mining codes, which specify government institutions are responsible for administrating the law, negotiating licenses, and the overall supervision of the sector, is that what actually happens in practice? Can the central government actually enforce these regulations on a provincial or even municipal level? And because of this, how essential do these licenses actually become to international miners? So normally before a company operates, there is like a list of checks they have to meet on their impact on the environment. They will have to make a plan on how they will be addressing all the environmental challenges they will create during production. Unfortunately, you have all these papers, but like very little is done in practice. So the company would start, they would have people coming and checking, but like most of these inspectors, they, they would come, check, make a report that the company asked them to make. But very little has been really done to uncover what is the actual impact the uh, company has on the environment and if some changes need to be made. It's very surprising that over decades we haven't had any case where the government has sanctioned one of these companies. Like all the reports are always very good 
uh, and this is uh, very worrying. At the same time, so this is on the industrial side where you have big companies. So in the artisanal side, though it's at smaller scale, but you also have many people operating. And in this case, they don't even acquire the licenses and so on. They, they operate illegally and this gives them more leeway to kind of do whatever they want because they can hardly be punished since they didn't acquire a license that can be taken away. So either you acquire a license, you have room to not respect what has been agreed upon, or you may have also people who, with the blessing of the big authorities in Kinshasa, are operating without having any documents. Or in some other cases, they are just in areas where the country has no means to control them, like in some forest or some area where the administration is very weak. And they continue operating, making arrangements with the local staff of the, the government that is present there. And Kinshasa has little or no knowledge of, of that. So to summarize this question, it's quite difficult to have these uh, licenses as a, a tool to enforce what has to be done for the communities, what has to be done for the country's development, what has to be done for environmental protection, because you have all these possibilities to either have the documents and not do anything it requires, or just operate without having documents as long as you have a person who can make a phone call and say like, yeah, everything is fine with him, don't disturb him or you'll have problems with me. So. And these skirtings of regulations, are they uniform across the entire country, or are some provinces more broken than others? When we look at it province by province, are these local authorities, the ones more prone to bypassing regulations that have been set by the central government, more common in the areas and provinces that might be under the influence of loyalists to the former president, Joseph Kabila, or under the influence of another faction that may not align with Kinshasa? Does the enforcement of these regulations differ from province to province, depending on their loyalty to the central Congolese state? I don't think it's only the distance from Kinshasa that makes it possible to, to bypass these regulations. But even the actors in Kinshasa have that happen. I, I can give an example in the Katanga region, where you have a big influx of Chinese-owned companies operating. And even as a researcher, you really struggle to access to the company and know what is happening. Like you can very well have your research papers stamped by the governor and just go there and uh, the, the CEO says, you, you're not coming in. You can go and speak to whoever you like. I will just make a call in Kinshasa. The governor will have somebody scream at him and all will go away. So it's a bit of interaction between what happens locally in some region and the power Kinshasa still has on this region. And usually either you have somebody, like you have a, an area where Kinshasa doesn't control so you can do whatever you like, or even if it, it did, you would still see cases where people are doing what they shouldn't be doing by having the support of Kinshasa. When it comes to politicians, it's also the same. So it doesn't matter if the, the region is being run by a governor who is loyal to the former president or the current president, or if you have a rebel group in control of an area, you can see that the practices and what the population experience does not really change a lot because all these groups and all these uh, structures running have the same weaknesses where you have a small group of people prioritizing their interests on the expense of the larger community and the country is not strong enough to punish them and protect everybody else from this elite that has just took, taken all the power in control. Looking through newspapers and some of the media coming out recently, there are some in the DRC who are praising the new budget set out by Prime Minister Sama Lukonda in just October this year. This draft budget presented was equivalent to a record 14.6 billion USD collected by the state to be used for the budget, which would represent a nearly doubling of the number of payments collected, with the budget indicating that around 80% of that was coming from mining. So if the budget is correct, where did this money come from? Have we actually seen a doubling of the resource extraction this year, or have the licenses been made more efficient and they're actually collecting the money now 
Or is there something else the analysts might be missing about these budgetary figures? I personally didn't take seriously what was said and I, I knew it was not going to happen. It has been the case many times that the, the government present a budget and then they, they know clearly it won't be achieved. So all they do is like use the national budget as a selling point, saying, okay, we're going to improve, we're going to build more roads and this is our budget. So we are very serious because we have big, big dreams, big goals and we will do everything to reach it. And then some months later, they have to say we were not able to and yeah, nothing will happen to them. What is actually sad with such budgets is usually you can see the, the share of the budget that is affected to the office of the prime minister or to the presidency or to the parliament being in excess of such uh, of, the, of the prediction. So even though they didn't achieve even half of the of the goals they wanted, even if the, all the roads, schools and hospitals that were planned never were built, you can still see the presidency consuming 100% above, or maybe sometimes more than 100% above what was planned for it. So you have this very big dream of like we're going to achieve, and which for me is more a lie than, than a dream because they know from the start this is not going to happen. So these are not the kind of people the, the citizen, the average citizen expects to really have their back and make a budget that will try to help them. Or as you were saying, take advantage of the mineral production and say like, yeah, we have this X amount of, uh, of mining companies, they can pay this amount of money, we can improve salary at this extent, have uh, X amount of schools. That's, that's not really the priority. The, the salaries keep stagnating at uh, the most of the, the population and their salaries, official ones and unofficial ones, keep uh, just skyrocketing. So I, I saw I saw this budget, but yeah, for me, it was just like another political move. People clap for it. They call him ambitious. They call him, uh, they, they see him as somebody who is going to bring some change. But we are now sometimes in his uh, tenure and uh, yeah, nothing has moved. The figures that we have in front of us here indicate that globally we will need to extract 26 times the amount of cobalt that we do now in the medium term in order to meet the exponential demands for new greener tech. This will surely mean people doubling down on the Congo to extract even more cobalt out of the country. So is the DRC ready for that? Can the current infrastructure within the DRC actually meet those skyrocketing demands? I think the DRC can meet that demand because like, it has been seen that it's possible to have already some beginning of transformation, though it's still very weak, but like with the right policies, with the right rules and good enforcement, it's possible to really increase the production, to have the, the, also the local community benefit from that. Uh, one of the key elements is really the, the governance. How are the leaders being held accountable? How the decisions they take are being checked to really benefit the communities, not just themselves. So we're seeing the situation in the east, particularly along the border regions, begin to deteriorate. And many cities like Goma are very worried about the possible return of full-scale conflict or violence within the region, with many of these worried citizens taking to the street as protesters. But when you look at the protesters' signs and speak to reporters on the ground, you keep hearing the sentiment that Kinshasa has failed, that the UN has failed, that the African Union has failed with some of these protesters even waving Russian flags and calling for Russian assistance. But so far, no one has answered those calls. So do you see any of these groups being willing to step in and help stabilize the region in the short or medium term, or will these areas continue to keep being ignored and continue to deteriorate? This situation is quite complex to understand. The, the thing is that there is a general sentiment of being fed up with Europe and the US having big promises, but for over 50 years after colonization, not much has been done by, by the way. So yeah, you can see some people having those flags, but it's more like being angry at the, at the US, not being happy with uh, Russia or with anything Russia is, is doing. When it comes to solving the, the problem with uh, rebels, I think it's now nearly 30 years that the eastern part of the country have been plagued by different rebel groups. They, they have taken arms, but when you check 
deeper in, you see there is another country that has just funded this uh, rebel group to have a control over a portion of the territory where there is something they can extract. And all this has caused uh, chaos and unrest, the eastern, and it has blocked the development and uh, the economy of the region. So when, when it comes to solving it, it's quite difficult when you have this interplay of uh, internal and external actors trying to create chaos and benefit from this chaos. You would really need a very strong government with a good army, not being co corrupt, where you'd have like some generals colliding with the rebels or with the foreign power that is supporting these rebels. So the, the, the country needs really to work on its army and make sure the army is able to defend. I think it's the local leaders and the local institutions that are the sole responsible for the security and the peace in their territory. And for now, there is a need for that. I think they, like the US, the EU and uh, all institutions should really be cooperating with the Congolese government, aside, uh, despite its, uh, its weaknesses, like to, to strengthen the army and increase the, the capacity. There are unfortunately some internal problems that hinder this ability, as I was saying recently. In such situation where the, the soldier is hardly able to, to feed his family, it's hard to expect him to work very hard to do his job as, as he should. And this does not only apply to the lowest rank soldiers, but also some who are higher up in the, in the army. So it's quite difficult to work out when the, the state is just there to benefit a small group of people while there is insecurity and the people who will go to the war uh, have nothing. You, you count on external power, which have also their own interest. They won't be defending the ones of the Congolese. Now we have the support from Kenya. Uh, like there, is a, there are some Kenyan soldiers that have arrived. But like, what are the chances that their only agenda is to come help the Congolese, maintain peace, grab their things, say, uh, see you next time and go home? Like, probably there is some other unknown factors and this may lead to some more complicated situation. So I think there is really a need for the Congolese army to become strong enough to control. And that's not easy when you have such a large territory and a country of which the total budget is like, if even if they achieved it, it would be like uh, 10, 15 million billions. And when you see compared to other armies worldwide, this is like very small. And this is not the army's budget. This is the budget of the entire country. So it's quite difficult to achieve the level at which the army can maintain peace all, all over the country. But that's actually the only way to go. There is no way external powers can manage to maintain peace. So along the east of the country, outside powers are beginning to smell blood in the water. Uganda, Kenya, Rwanda, Burundi all see absolute riches buried in the hills just over the borderlines. And they don't see any semblance of a national army there to stop them. So the central government only has a few options open to them. Throw every dollar they have at the army, knowing the corruption rife throughout its ranks, in a desperate hope to try and re-secure these areas. Or do nothing and watch one of the only profitable areas of the country become occupied by rebel groups, foreign armies, and mining conglomerates backed by PMCs. And with the eastern border of the Congo being so porous, there's very little they can do to stem this tide. This problem is only going to get worse as Kinshasa watches guns and enemies flow in and their resources and potential cash flow out. So what will the Congolese actually do about this? Will any country heed the call and deploy forces in the area to actually stabilize them without trying to resource extract themselves? And what does all of this mean for the global cobalt supply chains? Well, to answer that, we turn to our final guest. Part 4. To Deplore or ignore. DRC represents one of the most complex 
security situations on the continent. You have a country that has experienced instability for decades, a country that has drawn in neighboring states into its conflict, a country where neighboring states carry out their own proxy conflicts on its territory. I remember, um, I guess probably 20 years ago or so, references to Congo as the site of the first African world war because of so many actors that had been drawn into the conflict. It's a vast country that requires immense infrastructure and strong governance to effectively govern this space. But unfortunately, the infrastructure, that capacity is lacking. And so you have so many ungoverned spaces that are ripe for exploitation. And that's something that we have seen pretty consistently over the years. The presence of so many regional actors, the vast size of the country, the ethnic tensions present in different pockets of the country. And now you have added to the mix the growing attention and need, desire for the minerals that this country can provide creates a very complex security environment that is challenging to understand and even more challenging to resolve. Amelia Colombo is a senior associate at the CSIS Africa program and a senior security risk analyst at Voxcraft Analytics. Prior to this position, she also served as a senior analyst at the Central Intelligence Agency covering African and Latin American political security issues. And we're thrilled to have her back on the program today. In the pillars of U.S.-Africa policy have been pretty consistent since the 60s. It's a focus on democratic development, economic development, security issues, things of the sort. Different presidents may prioritize different aspects of these pillars. They may um, pursue different policies to try to achieve the goals that underpin these pillars, but they're all pretty consistent. And as a result, the U.S., I think when they look across the continent, they have to pick and choose the partners that are best suited at pursuing some of these priorities. And I think especially since 9-11 and the focus on countering terrorism, we've certainly seen increased U.S. interest in security matters. So we, we see greater partnerships in East Africa with an eye towards containing some of these security threats and unfortunately, as important as Africa is to U.S. national security interests when placed in the larger pantheon of U.S. national security interests and potential partners, uh, it tends to rank rather low. And then once limiting, I guess, the amount of resources that the U.S. has to devote to the continent as a whole. And so then on top of that, the U.S. needs to parse out those resources and prioritize partner countries. And so as a result, Congo tends to get shunted towards the bottom. Uh, that's something that may change as the U.S. looks to advance green energy and again, the resources that Congo may provide to that effort. But to date, there are other nations that are perhaps more suited to partner with the U.S. in pursuing U.S. national security interests on the continent. So what is the U.S.'s main security strategy when it comes to the Congo? And is there also a model country in this region of the world that the U.S. might be able to model their future engagement strategies on? U.S. security engagement with Congo is rather low. I, Congo may benefit secondarily. You see that Kenya is leading a renewed East African effort, helping the security situation in eastern Congo. And so certainly lessons that the Kenyans have learned through cooperation with the U.S. and East Africa will probably be brought to bear in that situation. But I think in terms of direct engagement, it has been quite limited. One of the main limitations placed upon the growth of the DRC is the almost non-existent infrastructure throughout the country as many parts of the country still aren't even electrified, making the running of any business quite difficult. And even for the companies who are established and set up inside the DRC, may want to expand and find other mines, will also come up against huge logistical problems, particularly trying to get those minerals from those mine sites to refineries and points of sale. As many mining companies who work in the DRC might be able to get the minerals out of the ground, but have almost no rail lines to stick those minerals on to try and get them to the port or for that matter, roads that are suitable enough to take some of the largest trucks to save on trucking costs. And to compound this issue, looking at the climate data we have here, the indications are that for the DRC, as climate change worsens, Congo will be subject to more and more aggressive flooding, making most of these roads even riskier to try and transport goods across. So if infrastructure is the priority 
who would be most likely to be responsible for its build-up? Would it be outside governments like the United States or China? Or would it be the Congolese government? Or would it be private companies like Glencore or Molybdenum? Who will this task of building up this much-needed infrastructure in the country it will likely fall upon? I think partnering with Kinshasa, whether it's a private company or official government to government, I think it's tricky given the lack of government reach in Eastern Congo in particular. Uh, that is a very large ungoverned space. And while you have ostensibly some state presence, you have the presence of Congolese military. I think the ability of Kinshasa to follow through with bilateral agreements is difficult and that contributes a lot to the instability and the exploitation that you see in the region. You, know, you see reports of illegal armed groups in the area who benefit from mining enterprises, who take advantage of the lack of governance and the susceptibility of corruption among st the state actors in the area to facilitate these mining operations that they then use to fund their own operations. So I think in terms of whether it's Glencore or another government trying to make an agreement with Kinshasa, I would take it with a grain of salt just because of this lack of capacity potentially to follow through. And even with the best of intentions, the, the susceptibility of some key actors in the region to corruption that could undermine any sort of agreement that's established in the capital. And is there the way or even the will to actually solve any of these corruption problems in the near term? The government lacks the capacity to address the task. The task is huge. And between issues of political will and just simple capacity, any effort at cracking down is limited. Even if you look at, for example, U.S. government efforts, we have laws on the books that are require U.S. companies to report where their minerals come from. And these companies, Apple, for example, the supply chain is so complex that even these companies that in theory should have the capacity to monitor where their resources are coming from are finding it difficult to do so. And all the more for a country that those who would be in a position to develop and implement the policies to build capacity potentially have an incentive not to if they are benefiting financially from these mining enterprises. I mean, the fact that things are so unstable in Eastern Congo is, is itself a function of this lack of government reach, weak governance, sort of social and economic instability in the region that right off the bat makes it difficult for the government to really crack down these corruption issues. What about the IMF, the World Bank? Could Kinshasa look to those guys to give them the funding they would need to get the infrastructure in place? There have been some efforts, but again, this lack of political will and capacity on the ground really limits the impact of these multilateral efforts. At the end of the day, a lot of the implementation and follow through really boils down to Kinshasa. It's their country. It's their government. Without some level of cooperation, without some level of effort and commitment from the capital, different multilateral initiatives, bilateral initiatives just fall flat. Well, if they don't have the infrastructure capacity to really expand the amount of mines, they can at least look at improving the mines they already have. There's been a lot of talk at the moment about trying to crack down on mines with particularly bad human rights records with a number of different initiatives being proposed. But do you think these initiatives would actually end up achieving their goals, or is it more likely that they end up much like the final results of the Kimberley Accords with the diamond industry? Absolutely, absolutely. It's interesting to note that um, while the DRC is the world's largest coltan producer, for example, um, Rwanda came in third, Uganda came in ninth and Burundi 11th, even though these three countries have scarcely any deposits of this mineral, which really, really strongly suggests that coltan that is being mined in Congo is finding its way into these three neighboring countries and appearing in their export data. Uh, so I think there absolutely is this issue. Smuggling and trafficking issue is a huge complicating factor in the ability of countries and companies to track the really the, the source of the minerals that they use. If we assume the best of intentions that companies are trying their hardest to comply with US law, for example, 
requiring this sort of disclosure of where these conflict minerals are coming from, it's very difficult given this trafficking angle to the story. But all this is happening before Western companies have even really rolled out any extensive sanctions or requirements on coltan miners inside the DRC. So why are smugglers already looking to smuggle their coltan into Rwanda, Kenya, Tanzania, or Burundi, or any other countries? Is it because those countries are close by and have better infrastructure than Congo does, or are they trying to skirt internal taxes or sanctions? So now we're getting into the complexity of the security situation in Congo, specifically in the Kivus. I don't believe that this is an effort to avoid sanctions or to skirt some sort of international regulation on minerals. What we're seeing is the effects of this unregulated space, which has created a playground of sorts for Uganda and Rwanda specifically to carry out their own proxy war, if you will. Both countries have been accused of backing armed illegal armed groups in Eastern Congo. Groups that, according to UN research and other expert um, research and information, control some of these mining operations informally and in areas where they have very easy access to both Rwanda and Uganda to then you know, traffic these minerals into these partner countries. And the money they gain from it then they use to fund their operations, to recruit, to buy weapons, um, to combat each other for control of different mining operations or to recruit artisanal miners, to pay off local Congolese authorities, whether the security authorities, political authorities, to allow these operations to flourish. It's a, a pre-existing trend, certainly, but one that we've seen flare up again in the past couple of years, as we have seen um, the M23, for example, become more active once again. So if Kigali, the capital of Rwanda, is behind these moves in the east of Congo, what is their aim here? Are they hoping to take some of these mines for themselves or keep Kinshasa off balance? I mean, what does Rwanda gain from these escalations? There are a couple of issues at play. We can't ignore some of the historical issues, being in mind the legacy of the genocide, how Kagame came to power. It's not surprising that perhaps they would be support, his government would be supportive of Tutsis who are similarly at risk. Um, we have certainly seen reports of increased ethnic tension in Eastern Congo, increased targeting of Tutsis in particular, um, building on sort of a historical marginalization of Rwandan Tutsis in the region. So it would not be surprising that Rwandan officials would want to protect their fellows in that sort of circumstance. I think we also need to be mindful of this long-standing historic rivalry with Uganda. I mean, Rwanda and Uganda were once allied in Congo, in fact, but relations between the two broke down. The group that they were sponsoring split in two, and we've seen that rivalry sort of wax and wane through the years. And it, it probably is seeking political dominance in the region. And then I think we need to look at this economic factor. As the demand for these minerals grows, so of course does its value, and who doesn't want extra income? And so we see reports of Rwandan back groups and Ugandan back groups coming to blows over control, over access to these informal mines. And again, we should consider the economic and commercial angle of Rwanda's economic and commercial interests in the region as another factor why they would want to potentially sponsor a group and gain a foothold. It's probably no coincidence that the M23 seemed to resurge about the same time that Ugandan troops were deployed to the region, ostensibly to counter the ADF, a Ugandan rebel group that fled to Eastern Congo and that in October, November of 2021, claimed responsibility for attacks in Kampala, which gave the Ugandans the perfect opening to deploy troops into Eastern Congo to handle this group. But again, that deployment, while seemingly understandable from a national security point of view, likely triggered significant concerns in Kigali that would, um, again, help explain perhaps why the M23 at the same time also experienced a resurgence. To any long-term investor looking at going into the DRC, 
this must look somewhat daunting to them. Companies looking to set up mines usually look at mine lifespans of 15 to 30 years so they can get maximum profit from their investment, which is the main reason why companies often pick nations like Australia or Canada, as yes, those countries would cost a lot more in labor, but at least you can be pretty confident that that country would remain somewhat stable for the next three decades. And then it's pretty unlikely that roving bands of rebel Australians would look to seize your mining investment at any point. So with all this in mind, why are companies still expanding and sinking their reliance into the DRC, whilst also seeing the East begin to heat up with tensions between Uganda and Rwanda, and the South begin to split down ethnic lines as well? I can see Congo being appealing to countries that want more unfettered access, countries that are okay without a whole lot of regulation, who prefer to avoid red tape and reporting requirements and all the rest that sometimes some governments might require. So there's a certain appeal in that, sort of the freedom to just operate. You cut your deal with whoever you need to and do what you need to do to get the minerals that you require. Perhaps the demand for these minerals increases as their price increases that may off help offset some of the risk as well. I think if you look at oil companies, for example, who operate in some really questionable environments, really dangerous environments, they can do so because the profit is so great and offsets some of those costs. Perhaps as the demand for these minerals increases, as the profitability of them increases, they can help offset some of the costs. It's a mineral, it, there's probably a limited supply worldwide and competition for controlling any supply you can get will probably increase along with the demand among different countries working to transition to cleaner energy. Well, if these companies are going to view the situation as worth the risk, then the conversation moves to defending their investments. As these mine sites, once they become operational, become very attractive targets for rebel groups, local fighters, or even occupying armies from neighboring states. Someone like China, who's building a lot of mines in this region of the world, who are likely to simply build a perimeter around their mine to protect it, are they more likely to pay a local group to provide security, or are they likely to hire one ethnic group to start eliminating the other in order to protect their mine site? Or would they just hire PMCs like Russia's Wagner Group? Or in other circumstances, where the mine is being almost entirely run by Chinese nationals, would they offer local armed law enforcement to shoot and protect their local workers on site, similar to the offer Beijing made to the Solomons after attacks on Chinese infrastructure. Leaning on Kinshasa to provide better security may have limited results unless more investment takes place in the security services, or perhaps they are limited to just securing a very small area. So. Perhaps it's a scenario where Kinshasa identifies a unit or two that will provide security to a Chinese mine in the limited area. Perhaps uh, the Chinese provide some training or supplies at least to those units that will be guarding their mine, and perhaps that is sufficient. Looking at it from the perspective of the Chinese government, perhaps an easier solution would be to bring in private security companies trusted companies that can provide security to this limited space. That might be uh, also a, a less cumbersome and more um, quickly effective approach. The other risk, perhaps going back to funding or somehow supporting specific government units to provide security, I think the other problem that could potentially arise from that is the perception that the government prioritizes the mining over any other security. So here you have this one little elite area that has the best troops, that is relatively secure, whereas the rest of the province is left to its own devices. And again, I think the risk from that is feeding popular grievances against the state, feeding this perception that truly the government is corrupt and ineffective and only serving the elites rather than the wider population. Another complicating factor here in the DRC is coming out of the protests rampant in the east of the country at the moment. And when you watch the footage of these protests, one of the first things to strike you is that quite a lot of the protests are holding Russian flags or even big printouts of Vladimir Putin's face and holding signs explaining that the African Union has failed, the UN has failed, Kinshasa has failed, now it's time to turn to Moscow for help. So can you explain to me why these groups would be trying to reach out to Russia, a country who's had very little to do with the DRC over the years? 
when you look continent-wide, there is definitely this sentiment among pockets of the population that Russia is a better alternative to pretty much all the other prominent partners on the continent. Europeans are often denigrated for the colonial past. The U.S. also gets blamed for exploitation throughout its history and, and its relationship with Africa. And even though you know, the Soviet Union slash Russia was a player in the Cold War on the continent, somehow they get off a little bit more easily than some of these other partners in terms of public sentiment and the perception that Russia was never a colonizer, that Russia has never exploited the continent as some of these other partners have. Depending on how the security situation in the East evolves, the demands for improved security, Kinshasa's own assessment of where its fortunes lie, perhaps we do see circumstances develop that increase the likelihood of Russian private security mercenaries coming into the region to enhance security in exchange for minerals, um, it certainly seems like so a lot of the elements are there for that kind of choice to be made. And if the West continues to let the DRC security situation deteriorate even further, and we do see Kinshasa turn toward Russian private security in a moment of desperation, much like the government in the Central African Republic has already done, does Washington worry about Russia having a direct control over the world's main supplies of cobalt? It would, and perhaps that then changes some of the calculus on how different governments approach Congo. Perhaps the risk of Russia gaining a greater hand in this market will either compel some countries to invest more in the bilateral relationship with Kinshasa to avoid that scenario, or look for other sources and partners to potentially counter that increased influence. But I suspect that bringing Russia into the scenario would create a more complex, I guess, big power competition potentially in the East, which is another dynamic that often puts off the public in terms of how it views all three big powers as these local communities start becoming a talking point in this great power competition. So the people who live in these regions of the DRC, who already have tenuous faith in the government in Kinshasa, are set to have some pretty harsh times ahead as the climate data suggests that flooding in particular is going to be a major issue throughout these regions going forward, with this flooding very likely to devastate local areas and crumble local economies. And with the West paying very little interest to the region and Kinshasa having very little funds available to be doling out disaster relief, are these groups in the east and south of the country likely to experience compounding levels of resentment toward the central government in Kinshasa as flood after flood impacts the region and the central government does very little to actually support them? What climate change will do for Congo as much as it has done in other countries as well, it really exposes the weakness in governance and really threatens that social contract between government and its citizens. To this extent, it even still exists in some ways. I think it'll expose how weak it really is. I suspect what we'll see is populations lose faith in the state as the needs of different groups increases and the state's unable to meet that. I think we will see greater resentment and grievances towards the state. At the same time, that we'll probably see increased conflict. These major climatic events result in displacements, result in lost income and access to resources. And the two combined creates greater competition for these limited resources and a greater risk of putting people into conflict with each other. Another stumbling block for the government is to the extent it does have some capacity to either deal with the situation once it's taken place, once that big flood has wiped out a community or that drought has destroyed agriculture in a particular area, to the extent they do have some sort of response mechanism in place, how is it being deployed? And to what extent is there a risk that the population in need will look at that response and find fault in it, find a bias, find a sense that some people are benefiting while they continue to suffer? And to the extent that these perceptions fall along ethnic lines, regional lines, 
we may again see another factor driving grievances, increasing the risk of conflict in these areas that are already quite vulnerable to conflict and tension along multiple lines. Because of the mineral wealth here in the DRC, do you see the country becoming a major pressure point for a number of the larger geopolitical players? And that the Congo might start factoring into these countries' strategic equations a bit more in the near future? Or do you think the DRC will forever remain an afterthought to these players until the point when it's probably too late? Looking out 10 years' time, there are probably, I'd say, three factors that we should keep an eye on to best judge the trajectory of stability and prominence in the Congo. Most importantly is the trajectory of the relationship, or we should keep an eye on the relationship between Rwanda and Uganda. When tensions increase between those two, violence tends to worsen in Eastern Congo. So monitoring that bilateral relationship, watching how these two leaders or their successors interact with each other, how they resolve their bilateral issues will be important to stability in Eastern Congo as well. I think another issue we need to look at is the demand for the minerals in Eastern Congo and the extent to which that drives instability, the extent to which that either brings about some structural changes in the country or just reinforces what's already in place. If we saw perhaps greater coordinated pressure among key actors on Kinshasa to better regulate, to um, develop the political will and work with partners at building the capacity to better regulate mining in Eastern Congo, to better monitor how it's carried out, perhaps we would again see greater stability in the region. The economic rents from these mining operations benefit the country as a whole, or at the very least, the provinces where that mining is taking place. But again, that will depend on coordinated pressure on Kinshasa and some real effort at partnership and capacity building. And finally, there is that question of what's going on in Kinshasa. Their presence is quite weak in the East. I don't know that 10 years will be sufficient to reestablish it. And I think even looking at these different armed groups and looking at historical research in how conflicts come to an end, even when a country develops the perfect strategy for addressing both the military equation and those underlying grievances that drive the conflict, at best, it can take 10 years to turn things around. And in Congo, that security situation is so complex. There are so many armed groups operating with different agendas and different supporters, that even developing a comprehensive, perfect strategy will take some time and then implementing it much longer. Based on that alone, even if today Kinshasa had a change of heart and fully committed to improving governance, partnering with interested states and building that capacity and really turning things around, we would not see a huge, massive improvement in this 10-year time period. We're looking at a long haul in terms of creating true stability and growth in the DRC. So we appear to be drifting toward a deep geopolitical crunch. And yet, few people seem to be preparing for it at all. The conversation seems to be going... We're all committed to fighting climate change. Yep. And we all know for certain that climate change will require the electrification of a whole bunch of vehicles, power generators, and heating systems. Yep. Which for efficiency will require us to make the next generation of batteries. Yep. Which means we will need 26 times the amount of cobalt that we use at the moment. Yep. And we agree that the Congo is the most viable source for that cobalt. Yep. So we should start to secure this now, or at least factor the DRC into our policies around Africa. And that's where people stop. When it comes to policy making, we all seem to be agreeing with the findings, but not with the conclusion. Inaction here will mean a bottleneck forming very quickly in the future. If we need 26 times more cobalt, then we're going to have to set up more mines. And right now, that's not a huge priority. When it comes to the DRC, we don't even have the transport, rails, infrastructure, and docks ready to handle the volumes that are projected to go forward, which come crunch time will mean companies producing 26 electric cars, but having 25 of them sitting on the factory floor as they wait on the minimal amount of cobalt to be able to build the batteries that power the cars. 
And even that one battery assumes that we still have free and open access to the cobalt supplies we have today, which if the country breaks down, isn't a guarantee. And this is just a basic logistical bottleneck. We aren't even factoring in things like war breaking out, which seems quite likely going forward. We aren't factoring in these mines being destroyed in the fighting, which may take months or years to repair. We aren't factoring in fighting nearby, forcing the mines to shut down as people are evacuated, meaning even further cobalt shortages. And on top of this, we're not even factoring in disgruntled rebel groups who might look to exact revenge by sabotaging the cobalt whilst it's in transit, traveling down the incredibly limited number of paths between the cobalt mines and the ports. In a country where an attack on a key bridge or key highway could prevent a huge amount of cobalt from reaching the global markets. There are also wild cards to think about here, like the fact that we aren't even factoring in what happens if the exact situation currently unfolding in the Central African Republic, a country on the DRC's northern border, unfolds here in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where the security of the country is turned over to private Russian military services, bringing about a situation where an antagonistic Russia, who provides private security to the leadership in Kinshasa and around the mines themselves, would have control of which country's shipments of cobalt they protect and which ones they let fall into rebel hands. And all of these risks and instabilities will, by basic economics, push up the price of electric vehicles, reorientating the price trajectory for electric cars to become widespread and adopted everywhere, removing loads of carbon from the atmosphere, moving away from that and towards electric cars once again becoming an expensive luxury item that very few people can afford to use, making the whole project much less effective in the fight against climate change. And this is just the situation with one mineral in one country. We didn't even get a chance to talk about our reliance on Angola's supplies of neodymium, which is needed for magnets, smartphones, and miniaturizing electronics, or our need for terbium coming from Madagascar for its use in semiconductors, or our need for dysprosium coming out of Burundi for the creation of nuclear control rods. And those are just to name a few, as every single one of these countries is set to become of absolute prime geopolitical importance in a green tech future. And yet, every single one of them is being completely ignored. Thank you so much for tuning in to the fourth episode of this brand new mini-series. Each and every episode we've released of this series has just got bigger and bigger, and we're completely blown away with all the messages of support and emails and comments that we've seen come back to us on this one. To pull this together has meant so much extra work to do because it is climate change. But fortunately, we've been lucky enough to work with a team over at Mission Climate Project, a specialty climate change think tank, and combine their climate data with our security data and be able to plot out exactly where the regional flashpoints are likely to be, giving us great data like which parts of the Congo are most likely to experience severe flooding in the near future. It's been an absolutely amazing experience to work with these guys, and we're really excited to finish this series with a bang in about two weeks' time. If this is the first time you've checked out the program or you want to find out more about the project or anything else we've got coming up, you can find all of our links on Twitter, Reddit, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, and TikTok on the handle at the Redline Pod. Or if you're keen to follow me on Twitter, I'm on the handle at Mike Elliott Oz. If you're keen to follow the Mission Climate Project on Twitter, they're on the handle at Mission 2020s. To maintain some consistency with the regular program, here are our three book recommendations for this week. The first is The Looting Machine by friend of the show, Tom Burgess for an in-depth look on how mining is impacting the African continent. The second is Cobalt Red, How the Blood of the Congo Powers Our Lives by Siddharth Kara, for a look at how deep the cobalt industry impacts our lives as well as the lives of the people living in the DRC. And the third is Dancing in the Glory of Monsters, The Collapse of the Congo and the Great War of Africa by this week's guest, Jason Stearns, for a look at the history of the DRC and a great retelling of the Second Congolese War. I want to say thanks to this week's guests, Jason Stearns, Ben Radnam, Bosisi Nakuba, and Amelia Colombo. All of you provided an amazing combination of sharp insights and nuanced policy. I'll be very sure to invite you back on the program sometime soon. I also want to thank my staff who've done so much work on this project. Wade McCarr, the producer, as well as his predecessor who did a lot of work on this project during the early stages. I also want to thank Perry Grace, Daniel Luzivella, Isaac Gibbs, Andrew Garbery, and Robbie Sutton, our research assistants and writers, Francis Leach, our director of Breaking News, Mark Spencer, our second voiceover artist and in-house climate change expert, Jonah Gunn, our production assistant, Jamie Tanu, our media director, Ross Crabtree, our media revisor, Joe Hawthorne, our audio cleaner, Marissa Rafter, our videographer, and Nick Much, our field correspondent. 
This team has pulled some serious working hours to be able to put this mini series together for you guys. But in addition to my team, I also want to thank the team over at TMP, who provided lots of the data and assistance in helping us put together this project. So a big thanks goes out to Lou Munden, Peter Riggs, Ben Bowie, Yumiko Jamobo, Willie Munden, Ivana Pavkova, and Lauren Bartholomew. The TMP team has been absolutely amazing throughout this, and it's been an absolute pleasure to work with them on this one. But for now, the green line will be back in a fortnight for the fifth and final episode of this miniseries. And the red line will be back next week, airing a normal episode. But until then, thank you for listening, and good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, our guests, and the Red Line podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit theredlinepodcast.com.